Ja, herzlich willkommen. Ähm, schön, dass Sie so zahlreich erschienen sind zum zweiten Abend äh, der Mediasuch, unser offenes, unser offenes Kolloquium dieses Semester hier in der Sophienstraße. Das ist auch das letzte Semester, ähm, was wir zum Anlass genommen haben, ähm, nicht nur Leute aus der Sophienstraße hier zu Wort kommen zu lassen, sondern vor allem auch internationale Gäste. Heute Abend habe ich die Ehre, Professor Robin Forrest vorzustellen. Ich werde das auch nur ganz kurz tun, weil ihr werdet das dann, glaube ich, ausführlich selbst tun. Ähm, Robin Forrest war Ende der 60er Jahre äh, erstes Mitglied der Cambridge Computer Aided Design Group ähm, und hat das erste äh, wissenschaftliche Paper über Computational Geometry geschrieben. Ähm, wer schon ein bisschen länger hier in der Sophienstraße ist, der weiß, dass äh, wir eine große Tradition haben, uns mit Computergrafik sowohl im praktischen als auch im theoretischen und historischen Sinn auseinanderzusetzen. Ähm, er hat dann sich auseinandergesetzt mit etwas, was Bézier-Kurven heißt, darüber werden wir auch noch ein bisschen mehr erfahren heute Abend. Und diese Arbeit ist direkt eingeflossen in ähm, Adobe Illustrator, Postscript und äh, das, was wir heute alle unter einem PDF verstehen. Ähm, er war in seiner langen Karriere, die mittlerweile nicht mehr akademisch, sondern sozusagen nur noch freiwillig ähm, Stattfindet, deswegen wir uns umso mehr freuen, dass er heute hier ist, äh, weltweit unterwegs als Forscher und Lehrer in China, in Amerika, am MIT, in Xerox Park äh, und als Consultant für Xerox, DEC, Adobe Systems, Apple, Microsoft, Lucasfilm und Pixar tätig. Und ähm, er hat mir vorhin gerade gesagt, er hält nur noch eine Lecture pro Jahr, das heißt, ich denke, wir können uns sehr geehrt fühlen, dass eine davon hier sein wird heute Abend. Ähm, die Lecture wird 45 bis 60 Minuten dauern, danach gibt es noch Zeit äh, für Fragen und äh, wir werden sie mitfilmen. Wenn irgendjemand das stört, dass wir während der Diskussion auch mitfilmen, dann äh, sagt er es jetzt oder schweigt für immer. Okay, gut, dann uh, Mr. Forrest, we're very pleased to welcome you and the stage is yours. very much. Uh, I must apologize first for not speaking in German. I hope you, you can understand me. Um, I, I'm going to give a, a, a talk which is based on, on to a certain extent, personal experience. Um, and it struck me when I was thinking about what I might say that it would be interesting to look at how computer graphics developed, um, particularly how it was funded. Um, and War and Peace in Computer Graphics seemed an appropriate title, uh, as you will see. Um, I have to start at the, in the Second World War. Um, when, when there are various things uh, arise out of war, as you all know, the technology advances very rapidly. And um, some of the things that happened in the war led to computer graphics fairly directly. Um, firstly, uh, there was the development of aircraft design. The aircraft became much more sophisticated. And, and typically, an aircraft was designed as a series of planar sections through the fuselage and the wings. These were described on sheets of metal, and uh, that was the definition of the aircraft fuselage and wings a set of lines scratched in metal. And uh, then any, any copy which you used to make drawings for manufacture were, were of course prone to error and similarly um, if something happened uh, the, the, the definition of the aircraft could be eliminated very quickly. Um, so one of the things that happened was that uh, the North American Aviation Corporation developed what's known as conic lofting, that is the de definition of the shape of the aircraft in terms of little bits of conic sections. But the important thing was that the equations of those <coughs> conic sections could be defined in terms of numbers. So, so for the first time, the shape of at least slices through the aircraft were defined in terms of numbers and not in terms of drawings. So you could write them down on a piece of paper and lock them in a safe and nobody would lose the definition of the aircraft. Um, the, Second uh, 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 development was the development of catheter tubes. 
in particular for radar, um, but uh, um, <coughs> they became obviously the basis for displays later on. And some, but some of the other devices are still around, uh, and we have typically plotters. You don't see very many of these, I suppose, today, but they used to be in all computer um, setups, they all had a plotter. Uh, pen moves left to right um, on a bridge, and the paper is rolled past on the scroll, uh, or on the one on the right, it's just a huge flat sheet of paper. Um, computers obviously uh, developed out of the, of the war effort. Uh, I think you people all know about the decoding of the Enigma machine at uh, Bletchley Park. Um, there is uh, some belief that uh, the, the machine I put up there, the Mark Manchester Mark I baby machine, was not exactly the first computer. That something that they built at Bletchley Park during the war was the first true programmable digital computer. But uh, nobody really seems to know. The Manchester machine was a prototype, it, it just existed to prove that something would actually work. Cambridge built a machine known as EDSAC, uh, which first ran in 1949, and it ran a university computing service. So it wasn't just an experimental machine, it was a real working machine. Um, another strand is the development of control systems, the control movement of machinery and so on. In particular, the development of numerically controlled machine tools which could cut metal under uh, numerical, uh, from numerical data. So you had the, 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 the idea of the Mustang being defined in terms of numbers and now machines which could interpret those numbers and actually make the shapes. In order to do that, they needed computational techniques to uh, tell the machine how to move from point to point. After the Second World War, of course, we got into the Cold War and in particular the threat of uh, Russian attacks on the United States, which gave rise to um, a defense system known as SAGE. Um, this is a huge undertaking. It required development of advanced computers which worked in real time. Uh, you couldn't, start, you couldn't uh, use computers like that. Used to use computers by submitting a job on a stack of cards and waiting for a day and coming back for the result because you'd be bombed out of existence before you got the results of your computations. So it had to be done in real time. And uh, the planes were shown on screens as, as blips like radar. You, you can familiar with radar blips on the screen showing tracks of the aircraft. And they could point a light gun at the, the screen. Here we see a light gun, and that was pointed at the screen to identify uh, and to tag the objects on the screen. Uh, machines were large in those days. Uh, it's a sage, 0.2 of a hectare, quite an impressive size for a computer. Um, and. Uh, they obviously um, were, were, were rather strange beasts. At MIT, they developed a, a machine called the Swirlwind, uh, the first resistorized machine using a uh, core memory, and uh, production systems were built by IBM. And here we see a typical uh, control console for the same system. You, know, you see the, the screen has got bigger. Uh, but it's a bit like the computers that people used to love in science fiction films at that time. Lots of little buttons and knobs and dials and all sorts of things all over the place. Uh, thank goodness we got rid of all of those. The user interfaces would be totally different if we hadn't. So, I want to say a little bit about uh, computer memory because that happens to be crucial for the development of computer graphics. Um, uh, one of the most important factors in the development of computer graphics has been the cost of memory. 
Um, the Manchester machine used this thing called a Williams tube, uh, in which the, the data was stored on the surface of a cathode ray tube as a, an array of dots, or no dots, and you could read this electronically. Um, so, uh, one of the intriguing things was that when you ran a program on the Manchester machine, you could actually see your program executing. And if you had a loop in the, in the program, you could see these dots going around in trails in a very repetitive way. Um, so debugging was quite interesting in those days. Um, and as, say, if somebody claims that some very ingenious programmer managed to uh, program a, a, this machine, so part of the screen showed a glass of wine being filled or water being poured into a glass. But uh, lots of us have tried to track that down and haven't actually found, found it out. But programmers were ingenious in these days. There was one eminent Dutch computer scientist uh, who had a computer that was driven by a paper tape. Uh, programmers written paper tape. And he had a piece of paper tape that if you read it in one direction, it computed sine of an angle. And if you turned it around and read it in the other direction, it computed cosine. And you can think of somebody who produces a reversible sequence of instructions which could put other signs, of course, depending on the order in which you execute the instructions. That's rather remarkable. Anyway, the first thing that happened was after early memory was the development of what's called core memory. Um, you had a little ring of magnetic material which was threaded by wires, and you could set the direction of magnetization around the ring. Uh, by pulsing the wires. Um, uh, very, very difficult to manufacture in, in quantities um, and uh, very, very difficult to <coughs> produce uh, in all of it. Uh, has anybody here seen core memory? Well, I've got some with me. <laughs> <coughs> So you can see this after us. But this board here uh, contains 16k of memory. 16k <laughs> of memory. Um, you can work out how many bits that is and then work out how many little magnetic cores there are. That is quite a lot. So there's a picture of what the actually look like. The intersection of those lines are the little magnetic cores. They're at 45 degrees. Uh, and also disks. Uh, here's the, the first IBM practical disk being delivered. <laughs> uh, somebody once told me that uh, when their computer organization got a disk, it came in the big truck and the computer room was on the second floor and they all stood outside while a crane hoisted this up. <laughs> and just as they got to the top, it slipped and <laughs> fell down. <laughs> Um, they're very expensive, um, the very large, the one Cambridge machine which uh, I used, the uh, mainframe and Titan, uh, the disks were this diameter, um, they, they took quite a lot of energy to spin them up to speed. Um, and when they were eventually disposed of, people made them into coffee tables because you could <laughs> sprinkle magnetic powder over this disc, shake it, and then it would all line up according to the bits on the disc, and then you covered it with varnish and there was a nice coffee table. <laughs> um, so, because uh, memory is very expensive, the early displays were what was known as vector displays, that's it, Disney true lines, they didn't have grayscale, they, they, they weren't shaded images, they were line drawings. And this had the characteristic that the more complex the line drawing, the more memory you needed, and the longer it took to draw the image. Um, and what you stored in the computer was not uh, an image, but a sequence of instructions to create that image. Um, and then th that set of instructions was sent to a separate computer called a display computer, and that created the image on the screen. And um, this set of instructions is called the display file. And one of the tricks was that while you were computing one display file, 
you had another one which was drawing on the screen and you swapped them over. And everything you use nowadays, virtually everything is what's called a raster device. It has the um, ability to draw shaded images, pixels. Um, and the, the, one of the characteristics of that is that the amount of memory re required is independent of the complexity of the picture. Um, so you can put up one dot or a million dots and you don't need any difference in the amount of memory you've got. Um, the resolution is, is relatively limited. It's, uh, I, I did put in the slide at the end, but the resolution of displays that you have on your laptop or whatever nowadays, it only, I mean, there's less of an order of magnitude, I think, in terms of the number of pixels you have to play with compared with what we had in 1965. So everything else has changed enormously, but displays haven't really got all that much larger. Um, so the vector displays were obviously the kind of things you had in oscilloscopes uh, and radar displays. Um, and the line drawings were particularly suited to engineering design, engineering drawings. And that was the need uh, uh, from the marketplace. We needed to be able to produce engineering drawings. Um, there was always the thought that if you could get something cheap enough, then there are lots of these things called television dis tubes out there, and they could be used as displays, and they were mass market. So if you could somehow get the cost of memory down, then the cost of the screen would be incredibly cheap. Um, the other thing is that the, the, the raster display refreshes the screen at a constant rate. It doesn't flicker, whatever it is, it's, I don't know what it is that is, but it's a few frames per second, 96. Uh, whereas the vector display, uh, the, the, the refresh rate depends on what you're drawing. So the longer and the larger, the more complex the image, the more the image tends to flicker. You've all seen pictures of radar displays where something sweeps around, and by the time the, the sweep gets around to the beginning, the original image has decayed and has to be repainted on the screen. Now, uh, getting into computer graphics, uh, the Cold War funding, the Air Force in America put a lot of money, uh, apart from the, the defense system, into computer aided design and manufacture. They wanted to be able to make aircraft uh, easily, and the aircraft needed more and more complex shapes. So, Doug Ross at MIT uh, developed a programming language called APT for automatically programmed tool which was able to take numerical data and turn them into control sequences for machines to make, um, make something out of it. And here we see a little bit later on the left, uh, uh, Soviet Ford Motor, uh, no, it's Presti Fisher in Oxford, near, in, in England, made car bodies, working on an IBM display. I'll mention that display a little bit later. And on the right you see a five axis milling machine. That is a machine which can move in X, Y, Z and two rotation angles. So it can cut very complex shapes. And at this stage in 1970, McDonald in St. Louis had something like 75% of the, the total world collection of five axis machine tools in one room. Um, and they were making parts for something like the F 15 fighter, in which they took I think the main spar of the wing took a piece of um, titanium uh, and machined 95% of it away in order to get the little bit they wanted in the middle with the right configuration and strength. Very expensive, lots of money being thrown at the project um, because there was this threat from the east. The Air Force sponsored a computer aided design group at MIT. Uh, there was a multi-axis computer, time-sharing computer called Project, called Project Mac, and Ross went there, and Steve Coons, uh, who was one of the great pioneers of computer graphics, was also there. Um, the biggest prize in computer graphics is the Coons Prize, um, named after him. And he taught the number of people, um, we'll hear about Adam Sutherland in a minute, um, but 
Also, if you dealing with graphics and media, you may no doubt have heard of Nick Negroponte at MIT in the, in the media lab there. Um, he was one of Steve's students. A lot of the funding went to various places funded by the Advanced Research Project Agency of the New York Department of Defense. This is now known as DARPA, but was called ARPA. For some reason the name has changed. And it had the Department of the Information Processing Techniques Department. And we find a number of people who worked for that were very crucial in the development of computer graphics. Um, 1962, Lick Lider headed it up. His big thing was man machine communication. Uh, and that the, to be able to interact online with a computer gave you the ability to do things which you couldn't do any other way. It, it wasn't artificial intelligence, it was intelligence enhanced by the machine doing the drudge work, the difficult work, and the repetitive work, and leaving the human being to make the decisions and guide the way the computer progressed. So the big breakthrough. Uh, was a system at MIT called Sketchpad, 1963, uh, at a lab called Lincoln Laboratory. It ran a TX2 computer, which was, uh, I mean, this was a real science fiction buffs computer. It, it occupied uh, several rooms. It had all the latest technology, but it still had all the old technology. So you'd go in there and it'd have core memory at one end and semiconductor memory at the other end. Uh, Wednesday was hardware change day when the engineers came on and, cha and changed the machine. And Thursday they, they modified the operating system to run on the new machine. And the rest of the time you could use it. Uh, so it was a rather interesting way of running the system. But it had this display, 1024 by 1024 points. And you could put this up and uh, control them. And you could point at the screen with a light pen. Um, and I don't know, are people familiar with a light pen? The idea of a light pen. The idea of a light pen was when you pointed it at the screen, it detected the flash of light that you got as it being past the aperture on the light pen. And because the image was being drawn by a program, uh, the light pen could send a signal to the control computer who said, what instruction were you executing just now? And he said, I'm drawing a dot at x, y. And so therefore you knew immediately you would pointed at this particular dot. And you could interact very directly with the image on the screen. Now you can't do that with uh, modern computers at all. They have to do a sort of search to find out what they're pointing at. And with these displays, you immediately could tell you were pointing at a particular dot on a particular line in a particular part of the screen and so on. So interaction was very immediate. We've talked about the display files, um, talked about the light pen. Um, so, uh, basically, set this on my screen, sorry. The um, thing that Sketchpad in, inaugurated this idea of interaction with the computer via computer graphics. Um, and the, the, you can find this in the, in the names of the early textbooks where the principles of interactive computer graphics. SIGGRAPH, the, the big uh, Graphics organization is a special interest group on computer graphics and interactive techniques. That was the big thing, interaction. And the early applications were in computer-aided design because we needed to be able to design complex shapes and go through and manufacture them. Now, you get to see a pattern emerging there uh, someone does a brilliant PhD thesis, the Americans have this system where they'll encourage uh, bright young people by giving them a responsible position as he moves to ARPA where he's in charge of <coughs> dishing out money to people working on things like computer graphics. So he goes off to ARPA. Uh, the Digital Equipment Corporation introduced a commercial display, General Motors a little bit later with IBM. And uh, just a digression, uh, around this time, uh, Jack Bresnan and Mark at IBM developed algorithms for producing optimal line drawings on digital devices. Originally for plotters, 
But virtually all the lines that you draw on machines nowadays uh, use Bresnan's algorithm for drawing lines. So if you had a, a mere fraction of a cent for every line that's been drawn using his algorithm, he would be incredibly rich. Now, at Cambridge University, um, Morris Wilkes went to MIT, he saw Sketchpad, uh, he also saw the time sharing machine there, the multiple access computer with terminals on it. He decided he'd do the same thing. Uh, well born at the engineering department, went there, uh, saw the same thing. So with Wilkes, they got together to form a computer aided design group in Cambridge. They hired one of the people that worked with Ross and Coons at MIT, Charles Lai, uh, as one of the first the three initial members. Um, I was the third, I was a research student. Um, and we set off in 1965 to do research in computer aided design. Wilkes had been given us £50,000 to spend any way he wanted. Now, uh, when you factor in inflation and all the rest of it, Fifty thousand pounds is probably, you know, it's probably getting on for a million euros nowadays. Um, imagine what a computer science professor could do here if somebody just said, "You have a million euros and you can go and spend it on whatever you like." <laughs> um, nobody even gives you a fraction of the amount of money to spend any way you like. But the, the important thing I think to learn that was that uh, the fifty thousand pounds spun off a huge amount of research and development, so it paid itself back. Uh, it was multiple, but, but I mean, nobody gives anybody that kind of money to play with nowadays, unfortunately. Okay, so the PDP-7 was an 18-bit mini-computer, 8K of core memory, 1024 by 2024 display, 3 bits of intensity, 100 vector drawing, um, but we had to draw the characters by software. And somebody stuck a television camera on that, and that's me in 1966. <laughs> so that was a display processor and a display. Um, quite large. Uh, serious hardware in those days. Um, but you had to do everything in this 8K word memory, 16K bytes. You had to store all the program, two display files, one was being displayed and one was being computed. Uh, we didn't have any hardware multiplier or device, that all had to be done by software. We didn't have any hardware character generation, that had to be generated by software. Um, so you had to do quite a lot in 16K memory. Um, input output in paper tape, teletype console, <coughs> light pen, and we had various other things we built to sit on it. But the great thing about it was you had no operating system. And you don't realize just how much of the resources of your computer are taken up by the operating system. It's a huge amount. And some of these early systems were extremely interactive simply because there was no Microsoft getting between you and the, the hardware. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was really extremely nice to do. You, you were responsible for it. that was it. <coughs> so there you see uh, the display, there's a joystick there, there's a light pen. This is the program I wrote for the design of three-dimensional surfaces. Not a good user interface, you had to sort of put numbers and three matrices there. But hey, you could look at each of these views full screen, you could spin them around and rotate them and all the rest of it. So it, it could be a fair amount. Um, then the, the UK government in the mid 60s got interested in technology and they thought it was going to save the nation. And they put a lot of money into establishing a computer aided design centre in Cambridge, which took all the research from the university and put it into uh, productive use. And uh, one of the things that happened there was that Martin you would see there produced, uh, used this, the same display to produce this grayscale image. Uh, by drawing a lot of horizontal vectors multiple times and so on. And you draw, drew this, you had a display file which took several minutes to execute. So, that, of course, you couldn't see anything in the screen, it was just this horrible flicker. Uh, what you did was you, 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 the display was in a dark room, you put a Polaroid camera in front of it, 
He opened the shutter and shut the door and went out for an hour and came back and he got that picture there. Uh, so that's one of the first Horatio images. And we, 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 you all subsequently tracked across various places and you can see later on in the history. Uh, so, at this stage it's very much uh, a game for those who have a lot of money. Um, Cambridge was given the money, but uh, largely uh, it, 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 the only people who really could afford it were the defence industry, uh, defence funded research groups, and the big car companies. Um, and uh, they had this big problem in those days. In order to make jet aircraft efficient and fast and so on, we required complex three-dimensional shapes similarly with jet engines. And they are shapes that cannot be drawn using conventional drafting in a series of two-dimensional cross-sections. They are fully three-dimensional. And they have to be made fully three-dimensional. So the new tools, tools were required to do that. And similarly, car bodies, I mean, car bodies are fairly complex shapes. Um, which recall the American cars of the 50s with all the elaborate shapes in the body and realize that they're not easy to make. Um, so, the, the IBM display I showed earlier cost a quarter of a million dollars. Um, that was just for the display, that wasn't for the computer. That was just for the, the, the thing that sat, you sat at. And you would find places, the aerospace industries would have 10, 50 of these devices. Uh, normalcy, it says. The catalog price of 32k memory of that PDP-7 computer, 32k, that's 64 kilobytes, $100,000 in 1965. Um, so, just think, uh, it's a staggering reduction in cost. And as a result, we, we, we've got so much memory now that uh, we really don't really know what to do with it. Uh, but it was very expensive. I mean, a, a frame buffer would have cost a fortune to build. You couldn't have a, a, a grayscale display or a color display in those days. It was just far too expensive. And just a, a slight digression. Around 1969, Bézier, who was a, 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 the production vice president at, at Renault, uh, got his form of curve and surface description uh, he had a system which he built which you could sketch a car body lines full size on a great big plotter, uh, about 10 meters long, 2 meters high. You could then digitize this and uh, by, by approximation you could get curves which match the shapes and you then uh, turn it into a machine tool which would manufacture body parts in form full size. So the Bézier system was developed in order to encourage people to define the shape of car bodies numerically rather than in terms of a big lump of clay, which is what they used to do previously. And I looked at his work um, and it, 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 he wrote it up, but I never quite sure why, in a very peculiar way. Um, and I rewrote his mathematics um, into the form which is everybody knows as a basic curve nowadays um, and that enabled us to work, work out just why it's such a good method of designing curves. We actually built a couple of model making machines based on the Renault model idea, top method is the first, the bottom method is the second. Uh, the one at the bottom I, uh, I designed and it, it ran at uh, um, it, it could write, it moved 20 centimetres a second at full speed uh, in three axes. And when it was cutting the material, it was just a blur of foam dust, um, horrible noises, and uh, eventually you got your model out. And you can see some of the models we made there on machines like that. The one at the bottom right is interesting because it's a, it was a model for a hull of a, of a naval vessel. But uh, because of the size of the machine, you couldn't make it the right length, so it's half the length and scale, but everything else is correct. And the Admiralty used it because 
they wanted us to do it because they thought there was something wrong with their design, which they couldn't see in any of the drawings they drew. When we made the model, we could actually see instantly where there was something wrong. And what were interesting, you could actually feel it with your hand. When you ran your hand over it, you could feel that there was something that wasn't quite smooth. I always tell my students uh, that I, 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 I tested that model in my bath to make sure it was all right. <laughs> so, uh, following on this theme of uh, busy cars, um, I took it to Xerox Park um, and uh, John Warnock uh, uh, used it as the basis for the, the graphics system they, they developed at Xerox. We'll talk about that later. Uh, and to do the outline of characters for printing, and uh, so that is why we read on to things like postscript and, and, and digital typography. Uh, but with students, I went to MIT, worked with uh, the Syracuse University, worked with Coons, and the Soviet from General Motors to uh, We had a series of students we taught who took uh, basically his work originally, turned it into things called beast lines, and then. Um, some of you have just got the horrible acronym NURBS, N-U-R-B-S, uh, which is widely used now in car, aerospace, uh, design manufacture, and also in a lot of work uh, in, in modeling for some uh, movie industry and so on. So that all grew out of that particular area. Now, just to move on, our part. Uh, funded originally, well, someone had a spell to ARPA, then Harvard made him a professor, uh, but he didn't like Harvard really, so he moved on to the University of Utah, um, where by coincidence um, ARPA had dumped a large amount of money for research in computer graphics. So someone then ended up at Utah with Dave Evans to develop computer graphics funded by ARPA. Someone was followed at ARPA by Bob Taylor later. Uh, Bob Taylor then moved to Utah to, to manage the money that he had sent to Utah uh, from ARPA. And uh, this money at the University of Utah was used in a whole variety of ways um, uh, to, to advance computer graphics. And led very directly to PostScript and PDF and Pixar and various things like that. <coughs> After um, Bob Tiller came Larry Roberts, who was ex MIT at ARPA. At MIT, he used formats and form HCs for the coordinates and things that are used now in all modern graphics cards. Um, first algorithms for hidden line removal, visibility, determination. Um, and then he, he, when he went to ARPA, he had, he had the the concept of the, he developed the concept of the ARPANET. So he is the man that had the original idea and put the money into places for the people to develop the whole ARPANET, which became the internet. Um, but his original work was in computer graphics. Now, uh, a lot of the work, as I said, was to do with uh, aerospace originally. Uh, need to do things in three dimensions rather than two. Um, one of the things you find when you move to three dimensions is that uh, engineers are very good uh, in designing three-dimensional objects on paper with three different views. And you could work out what was visible and what wasn't. When you, they, they, only put, they only drew the visible lines on paper. Uh, whereas if you were building a three-dimensional model, the computer didn't know what was visible or what wasn't visible. It had to work it out. So you had this uh, problem known as hidden surface removal, find out what surfaces were, you could see, what were at the back or obscured or something else. Uh, and the, the slightly more difficult problem, I uh, won't say why it's more difficult, called hidden line removal, which does the same thing for line drawings rather than shaded images. <coughs> now, Utah put a lot of money into the development of visual flight simulators. There was a great need for that in the, in the aer aircraft industry. I mean, although aircraft are incredibly imp expensive and crashing costs a lot of money, it actually costs a lot more to train a pilot, and you don't want to kill a pilot. So any training you can do uh, on the simulator saves a lot of money. 
Um, so they wanted to be able to do that. Uh, but because memory is very expensive, the initial displays couldn't do shaded images. They had uh, a limited amount of lines of points. They did night flying simulators. So you've got uh, dots and lines, runway lights, and all the rest of it. And then, with a very intermediate set of technology, you've got things which could do dawn and dusk, and you get a horizon line. Um, and then, once memory gets cheaper, you get into fancier things. Um, and you get shaky images and so on. But uh, in the 70s it cost uh, about $10 million for a visual flight simulator. Nowadays it's just one of the things that your graphics chip and your PC can do without even bothering with it. Uh, so here we see the the, 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 the one left, the light of dusk, a little, little amount of shading, and then a bit with shadows, and then finally uh, textures. Uh, and they look remarkably crude now. There was no child would use a video game with graphics like that now. They just reject it totally as being inadequate. But it was only good in 1980. They built various hardware boxes to do the matrix multiplication. Um, nowadays, I don't know how many matrix multipliers there are in the graphics chip, but um, uh, it's. Um, GPUs are known, but there's an awful lot of bits in there. Um, and then they obviously improved various graphics. PhD issues went through Utah and used better and better devices. So to get back to my theme of uh, war and peace, one of the people that turned up at the University of Utah was Henri Gouraud from France. The French have a program that you can uh, be sent on a mission of national importance, like getting a PhD at the University of Utah and finding out what Apple is spending all its graphics money on, uh, instead of going off and doing military service. So he was sent to Utah to do a PhD. Um, and he used a method of producing more realistic shading, and that's built into all the graphics chips nowadays. It's just simple linear interpolation. Or he's always very apologetic if you've got a PhD for something really simple, which was linear interpolation. But you can see as you go from left to right, the images get a little bit more uh, realistic. You get flat shading, um, which you can see facets. Then you get Google shading, which blurs things a little bit, makes it look a bit more curved. And then at the right, you get form shading and other measures in which you can get highlights on. They also built the first frame buffer. Um, Kajia was quite a character. Uh, he eventually uh, ended up at, as head of graphics research at, at Microsoft. Then he developed various techniques for text mapping uh, and at the erasing, dragging parts of images. Um, you see three of the pioneers there. Uh, I'm moving on reasonably quickly in this. 44 matrix multipliers, Jim Clark, after being at Utah and doing a PhD on interactive design of three dimensional surfaces, went to Stanford where he developed for, uh, a chip to do matrix multiplication. He wasn't a very good chip designer because he had a picture on his wall of one of his first chips running and he didn't understand the problems of heat generation. So he has a picture of his wall of this. Well, silicon is basically glass and this chip is running the sort of yellow colour you get with um, very hot glass. Um, and so he turned over the design after proving it had actually worked, even at that temperature, he turned it over to somebody who could lay it out a little better way, which wouldn't generate as so much heat. So he funded Silicon Graphics, then he funded Netscape, and uh, another billion dollar company. He's a serial uh, developer of companies who seem to do very well, and he manages to bail out on the companies before they go bust. Another great skill. <coughs> then he came up with Ed, Ed Catmull, and Catmull made it in this for several reasons. He developed a method doing hidden surface removal, known as a Z buffer or Z buffer, if you're American. 
Um, and uh, that's in everybody's graphics chip. So he, if he had made a, a small fraction of a cent for every uh, use of the Z buffer, he would be extremely rich. Uh, just like Jack Preston. He did all sorts of things on making fancy or uh, less jagged images. He developed uh, methods of defining curves and surfaces using a process known as recursive subdivision, which is used a lot now in Pixar. Um, and so, um, <coughs> so this is all funded by ARPA, and then he moves off to the New York Institute of Technology, which is a most extraordinary institute. institute. It's owned by this amazing character called Alan Shure, who is slightly mad, I think, and owns this vast mansion in Long Island, in which he is this private university. And he decided he wanted to make computer-generated animation. So he bought six of these the displays from Evans of Sutherland. I mean, nobody could really afford one. He bought six. And he bought Catmull. And Catmull got a whole lot of people to go and work with him at New York Institute of Technology. It just, it was a magnet. Everybody was drawn there. All sorts of interesting things were done. Paint systems were developed, and so on. And then George Lucas heard about this and got him to go out to California where he set up the, 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 the graphics section of Lucasfilm, uh, which existed for quite a few years, and then it became Pixar Animation and was spun up and bought by Steve Jobs. Um, you see Jobs sold it to Disney. And nowadays, um, Catmull is president of both Pixar and Disney Animation. Um, now, let's say you want Xerox opens this research lab in Palo Alto, Xerox Park, um, and uh, he is, uh, the idea is to develop the paperless office, uh, which is always rather amusing because Xerox makes more money out of selling paper than it does out of selling hardware. Um, but they had this idea of this, they, they lured Bob Taylor from uh, from Utah, thanks ARPA, and they also had a number of people from Utah, including Alan Kay, who is uh, another great in graphics, very uh, far-seeing individual, and he had this idea of the Dynabook. He wanted to make a sort of a 4 size computer on which you could display text and images and all the rest of it. Um, it sounds very familiar nowadays because uh, the, the originator of the iPad. Um, if you see some sketches there of his initial Dynabook and mock-up, and he started to build prototypes at Xerox. Um, the prototype is known, this machine known as the Alto. Uh, the interesting thing that Xerox did was that they put an Alto in everybody's office, including the secretaries, and they had to link them all together. So they invented the Ethernet. And then they thought, well, we're producing all these pictures on the screen, uh, how do we get them out? So they invented the laser printer. Um, and uh, we've got this ability to do text editing. Well, we've got a nice text editor from Bravo X. Uh, and then Charles Simone, the person who invented Bravo X, left, and I think he's Microsoft employee number four or something. Um, when the first uh, Microsoft Word came out, I, I was told by a friend at Xerox that I didn't need to read the manual because I knew how it worked already. It was just Bravo X, and it said it was. It was just absolutely carbon copy. The Alpha had one bit black white master display. You could use the mouse. Alan <coughs> uh, uh, Kay developed the Windows icon mouse interface. Um, some interesting people there, Larry Tesla, uh, <coughs> Apple, Dan Mary, the secretary, said she better get a PhD in computing, which she did, and then invented some significant parts of the, the Alto system. And uh, Jobs went there, saw what it was like, decided this was the future. Xerox was making no real good effort to commercialize the system, so it Jobs went off and uh, told people at Apple to develop the Mac. 
Um, and as I say, various other people went up from there, Scott and Gregor down at the um, bottom was one of my colleagues when I was at Park. Uh, he did not the first Microsoft Windows. Just in passing, uh, in Larry Tesla, I don't know how, uh, have any people heard of what's known as a card section at a US football game? The idea is a whole section of the stand, and they're given a stack of pieces of card, different colours, and they're all told at various signals they hold up the, the appropriate card, so it gives you uh, a picture on, on the stand. And Larry Tesla uh, and some colleagues wrote uh, what I think is probably the first um, raster graphics program, uh, which in his output was this card section at Stanford. Uh, but he did things like scan conversion of lines, and he had animations and all the rest of it running uh, by running a program which gave individual instructions to every student sitting in a, each sitting in a particular seat to hold up the right card at the right time. So he is actually an unsung hero. You can find this out on YouTube, I think, uh, a demonstration of this. One of the earliest bits of raster graphics ever seen. This is the first mouse at the SRI. Three buttons. Page systems developed um, at well, NYIT, Albie Ray Smith there had a 24 bit, he had three 8 bit frame buffers to play with. He did the first full color system, Dick Sharp, he was one at Xerox um, Park on the Color Auto, and they're one of the first um, develop, uh, winners of Oscars for technical development. And there is a high effort on the page system on the Park. Um, I just was it through the, the remaining few pictures. Um, uh, people went on then to try and develop uh, more natural shapes. I just mentioned, in fact, uh, Alfie Ray Smith who did, did a PhD in formal uh, uh, in, um, logic, uh, developed a system for developing uh, branching systems, which you to do things like trees. Uh, Bill Rees uh, invented the idea of particles that you could fire off and they had life and uh, they could explode and do all sorts of things. Uh, he did plants there. He did the uh, Lauren Carpenter, so go to fractals. Well, he published one of the first papers using fractal techniques for producing landscapes, but he was doing this at Boyd, again funded by uh, defense in some form or another. And he's now at uh, this sort of Pixar. And they all came together in a famous thing, the Genesis Effect. People have probably seen that in one of the Star Wars movies. Uh, one of the interesting things, just in passing on that, is that they built a rugged landscape and this planet develops and it has rugged mountains and so on. And because of the rush to do things, they, they developed a fly-through one part of it um, in terms of uh, very simplified versions of the final thing, and then they just ran the whole lot overnight um, to produce the final frames. So unfortunately, uh, in one part of the fly through, the, the fractal mountain actually grows into the fright path. So the, the, play, the, the rock and whatever it was would collide with the mountain. So they got in there and they sort of digitally hacked out a channel through the mountain, slab sides. <laughs> um, so it, if, if you don't know about this, you'll never notice it. But if you watch this particular sequence, all of a sudden there's a flash where this rugged mountain disappears and you get these vertical um, slight sided slabs of mountain, and then you're back the mountains again. The modeling shapes, this all came together in a famous image. Uh, I should say I'm running through this because I, I, I leave behind a set of notes so you can let you catch up. Uh, this image here goes to Point Reyes, Point Reyes is a place in California, but it also stands for renders everything you ever saw. Mm -hmm. um, and here they use texture mapping, they use fractals, there are some trees and shrubs in there, everything comes together in one of the early Lucasfilm images. Uh, then back again to the, the, the 
theory of, uh, theme of war and peace, one of the things that was developed in the, in, in the war uh, in Cold War was, was simulation of radiation attacks and also missile attacks on tanks. Um, and they wanted to find out how people would be affected by radiation firing at a tank turret. So they invented this technique known as ray tracing, which followed the ray of radiation and find out how far it penetrated. Then somebody realized that you could actually do this to find out what was visible by imagine firing at a ray from a three-dimensional object and finding out what it, what it hit first. Then you drew that. And they actually made some um, uh, <coughs> commercials for American television based on this, uh, I forget what they're called, uh, in particular, um, confectionery that they were using the commercials for. But then they realized that you could actually use this um, for uh, fancier things in computer graphics, and we got into the idea of ray tracing, in which you just didn't find out what was the first thing you hit, but you traced the ray and watched what it bounced off and what it went through, and how it reflected and refracted. And uh, this was developed by Tom Witted. Uh, very intensive process, but you get amazing images like this. Now, this will be rattled off of your laptop in a matter of seconds, but it took four hours on a big machine. So you can see how things are advanced. It's very good at reflection and refraction and transparency, but it didn't do much for ambient light. Uh, they kind of let the rest of this room bouncing off the walls. So Don Greenberg uh, used techniques which he had got from his work as a, a civil engineer with an architecture firm to do with um, heating in, in buildings um, and adapted that to bouncing light off walls and uh, sort of so that you can actually simulate all sorts of soft shadows, etc. Et but it came out of something not initially intended for anything like computer graphics. Um, I'll just give some examples of the combination of the two. Uh, these are quite old, but uh, they obviously considerably better than something that was going on you know, 10 or 15 years previously. See soft shadows there, um, lights bouncing up all over the place. Graphics software, um, nearing the end, because it's noticeably over my allotted time. Take his one. John Warnock started at Utah and then went to Xerox. Um, uh, and I actually arranged to go on sabbatical leave to work with John Monarch at, Europe, at Xerox Park, and he left in a month. Uh, <laughs> because he was a bit disgusted because Xerox were delaying on developing uh, the system for producing images or um, laser printers and all the rest of it. He developed a, a, a language um, to do this, and Xerox was sitting on it, so he got fed up and he went off and formed Adobe Systems, uh, and he came up with this language called PostScript. Uh, if you all know about it, it uh, it's based on basic curves and all things, it's the basis for PDF. Um, but the interesting, as far as this talk is concerned, is PostScript is actually his fourth attempt at the same kind of language. The third attempt was the uh, the, the, the abortive system at Xerox. The second attempt was a, the system which was behind all the graphics for the Xerox printers and, and, and displays, which was called JAM, uh, which stood for John and Martin, John Warnock and Martin Newell, we saw earlier from Cambridge. Uh, and the first version was a system he developed when he was working for Evans and Sutherland Computer Corporation, and it was a system which was designed to produce vast numbers of images of cacti and other things in the Arizona desert for flight simulator databases. Um, so it's something which started off life as uh, enabling you to get an in, a, a, a flight database for the whole of the state of Arizona for your flight simulator, uh, to do all the mountains and all the rest of it, ends up uh, being PDF. Um, so you can see that the Air Force funding goes straight through to a piece of paper that you can see today. The other graphic standard, OpenGL, uh, which everybody uses, uh, Jim Clark developed GL 
Silicon Graphics, but it, it had its origins at uh, systems at uh, Cambridge University called Gino, uh, Gino F, Martin Yule, um, and the University of Utah, again, Jim Clark and Martin Yule. So there's a whole series of things coming together um, with a variety of different kinds of funding. So, um, just to conclude, um, I think it's rather interesting that the technologies that developed in the Cold War are now absolutely universal. And by far the biggest use has nothing to do with, uh, with what they were developed for in the Cold War. Um, computer aided design and manufacturing are universal. The, the, the car works because of computer aided design, the aircraft flies because of that. You just don't notice it. It's, all, it's just the way everything is done. Um, you can see all the research from Utah and, and flight simulators ending up in computer games and the Pixar animation and special effects from the movie industry and all sorts of things like that. Uh, probably worth far more in terms of uh, revenue than anything that uh, was ever done for computer aided design. And, and all the characters you read, uh, virtually everything nowadays is computer generated in some form, they're all described in terms of curves which are developed for, firstly, for computer aided design of cars and aircraft. Um, so I'll give you a, a fairly rapid overview from my perspective, and I happen to be lucky to be in the right place at the right time, and uh, rather dominated by, uh, for historical reasons, by what went on in America, and lots of ties across the Atlantic. But of course a lot went on in other parts of the world, in Europe in particular. And a final remark. I went to visit Larry Roberts in the Pentagon once, which is an interesting experience. And I asked him this question, why is he putting all his money into computer graphics? And he said, well, it's all part of the anti-ballistic missile system. Can you think of a better way of spending that money? So I arrest my case. <laughs> War and peace in computer graphics. From a, and that came addition from Novosibirsk, who was apparently doing something. But that was the only contact I ever had with the, the Soviet Union. Um, the other way, uh, the British, Air, British Aircraft Corporation developed their own display rather like the IBM 2250. It was a horrible piece of machinery, but uh, it, it sort of worked. And they actually sold one to the Chinese. Um, and they packed it off with a copy of Chairman Mao's little red book inside the cabinet and never heard anything more about it. But I don't, honestly, no, I don't think there was. The, 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 the Russians ended up build, building indirectly copies of the IBM, IBM computers, but I don't think they really did much in the way of graphics. They'd probably make a very good job of it because they're much better mathematicians generally than we have in the West working these problems. More, more efficient solutions. Um, I was wondering, uh, you seem to be very nostalgic about the that dynamism of computing uh, when you start doing it, um, about the lack of an operating system. Is that something that you could imagine coming back into, in, in, into play? Um, well, I, I, I would hope so. I mean, Every time I meet Martin Newell, we always have this conversation about you know, what it was like in the old days and how interactive it was. And, and, and you, you, you then begin to think, well, you know, what is all that memory being used for? What are all these circles being used for? 
And there's a huge amount being used very inefficiently for the operating system. And the user interface uh, it takes up a huge amount of, um, of resource. Um, I suppose uh, you could devote uh, more and more hardware to be devoted to the user interface. You could get rid of a lot of it. But yes, I think um, <coughs> we're used, just used to having so many files and things all over the place and the organization of that is just incredibly difficult. So um, it would be nice to think that you could actually get back to a bare machine. Um, but but it, it is a little bit worrying. I mean, the kind of talent that programmed the, the computer that went into the, the lunar excursion module, for example, doesn't seem to exist nowadays. They sort of, they tend to sort of think, well, we'll, we'll run on, on, on Windows 7 or something like that. And, uh, we hope that it works. Um, <laughs> but uh, <coughs> I, I, it would be nice to get back to something which is much more immediately hands-on. But I don't think many, many people could uh, can actually do it nowadays. They're just not used, used to programming at that level of detail. Um, you mentioned briefly how a few people you know would be presumably billionaires if they had a fraction of a cent of their inventions. Presumably the same could apply to you and the Bezier curve. Um, did you, were you ever tempted to set up an Adobe systems or something like that to go into commerce for fully yourself? Well, when I left Cambridge, when the money started to run out, um, two of my colleagues, three of my colleagues, set up another a company in Cambridge. Uh, because one of the things they developed after I left Cambridge was uh, not so much the curved surface, but three dimensional solid modeling. Um, and they, they set out to, to make money from doing that. Um, and, and I had an opportunity of joining that, but I decided I wasn't a good programmer and I, I, I was more the sort of art, the research man, the ideas person. And I could probably, you know, give them ideas which would keep them going for two or three years. Um, but, but I would be unproductive for, I'd drain their resources for the rest of the time. So I decided to kind of stay behind and train the next generation of people to come along. Um, but that group at Cambridge, they ended up, the, the, they ended up Developing a, 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 a three of them, a, a, a thing known as the ACES model, model, modeling kernel, which went into something like seventy-five percent of all um, <coughs> seats in front of uh, three-dimensional CAD systems in, in the world. So they had a tremendous influence on a very small number of people. It took me ages to work out what ACES stood for, and it turned out to be. The, the first names of the three people were born. It was Alan, Charles, and Ian's system. Um, <coughs> but, yeah, the, there's also a sort of feeling that we were funded, uh, Cambridge certainly, but, but, you know, with state money, and uh, that we would, we would do consulting for American and European companies and charge them, but we wouldn't charge British companies anything because they were paying for us through, through taxation. We weren't entrepreneurs. Hi. Sure. I have a rather similar question regarding, say, uh, corporate psychology. Um, it seems like, um, or I have the impression from your lecture, that the, the Xerox company um, did not always act in their best business interests uh, with, their, with the developments they made. Uh, and um, it, it it almost seems as if they were acting or inventing stuff pro bono, and all the profits that were being made were uh, were made by their spin-off companies. Mm -hmm. um, could you explain what particular, um, let's say, corporate psychology was re responsible for for that for that effect? Well, <clears throat> I don't think I can, but there is at least one book, if not two, which have gone into that in great detail, um, and I can't remember what they are, but they're worth reading. Um, but you have to realize that I mean, Xerox was a very sort of conservative corporation. Uh, well, it wasn't originally when it invented xerography, but it was very conservative. And it was based back in New York State. And for some reason or other, they decided to set up this lab out in California, San Francisco, just a few years after 
uh, you know, hippies. And uh, they attracted people who you could imagine the, the corporate minds back in Rochester, New York, would regard as hippies. Xerox Park in the original days was, you know, full of informality. I mean, room, we wouldn't have room like this for a lecture. It was full of beanbags and you just lay around on the floor. And uh, uh, so on. And so it was, it was entirely informal. It just didn't fit into the corporate mold. And I think it scared some of the executives. They really didn't know what they'd got. I think that's a very important point that a lot of the uh, hardware and software industry of the 1960s and early 1970s was <coughs> mainly um, populated by people from the American counterculture uh, who immediately were the first ones to adopt to cybernetic ideals of society and who would start working in a very different manner there. There have been several attempts at analyzing this particular part of media history in relation especially to hallucinogenic drugs. Um, <laughs> for example, I think that Hitler who could be it might be. There was one character, um, it was there sort of a, a, a um, policy at one stage, if anybody asked to, if they could have a job at part, <coughs> they, would, they would give them a, uh, an opportunity to talk. And some guy who was a real acid head turned up and he desperately wanted to work at Park, and, uh, and, and the, so they said, well, come on, and give a talk, and he gave this thing which was just so, I mean, he was so stoned, it was unbelievable. Um, but he then turned up uh, as, as a night nice security guard at, at, at Park, and people go in in the morning and see these amazing pictures drawn in the screen machine. <laughs> so he got to do what he wanted. <laughs> from the salary he originally wanted. Uh, what makes the Bezier curve so good for rendering text? Text? Uh, I have to go into a quick look. Just a brief answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to be able to do curve outlines. And uh, th there, there are two alternatives. One was conics, but the trouble with conics is that you don't get very nat natural positions and points of inflection. And you can do that very easily with Bezier cards. Bezier cards happen to be much easier to compute with. And one of the first things that they did at Xerox uh, was to develop fast ways of taking these carved out and turning them into dots very efficiently. And you can do that much more efficiently than you could with conics. But then the controls of the thing where you to change the shape are very, very nice. You don't get bumps where you don't expect to get bumps, is the, the crude way of explaining why the basic occurs of good. Susanna? Oh, I was going to say, um, how much of the, the idea behind the paperless office was also about making computers accessible to ordinary mortals? And that level of user interface. <coughs> well, <coughs> Alan Kay started off with a, a, on the art tour with a, a language called small talk and the idea was he was very interested in, in theory of education for children um, and the user interface the windows icon mouse interface which we all use today was developed by Alan Kay for primary school children so there's a summary <laughs> Not for adults, it's for primary school children. Um, and I think also the, the other thing is that um, Bob Taylor, who set up Park, um, has a degree in experimental psychology and is very interested in psychology. And in fact, you can, if you visited Park or a litter deck where you set up a similar lab, I, I sometimes on the street uh, sneaking suspicion that park was just a great big sociological experiment as far as Bob Taylor was concerned. The way the offices worked, uh, the way they were laid out. You know, you had to sort of go past all the secretaries to get anywhere. Um, and the secretaries knew whatever they was, where they were, and uh, it, it all w was put together to facilitate people meeting uh, in, in odd places and so on. And you can see that, uh, I think he, 
there was that element of it. It was, it was to try and uh, bring computing to, to the general public, if you like, rather than hidden behind doors. Um, to a large extent, we haven't seen that much advancement in kind of the metaphor for our interfaces since um, the park days. It's sort of the, the window mouse icon desktop interface. Um, but there have been other experimental interfaces developed. Are there any alternate user interfaces that you've seen that you think are sort of a, a lost window or a lost uh, cul-de-sac in computing history that you think were particularly good? Well, I'm not sure. I think the, the there have been various attempts at 3D interfaces. I'm not sure how good they are. Um, I, I'm, but I'm quite impressed by a lot of the tactile interfaces now, touch screens, because the, the argument against touch screens always used to be that your finger is a very blunt instrument for pointing, and it's not accurate enough, and the screens get dirty and all the rest of it. But they seem to have got over a lot of these. So, gestural interface I think is very important, but it's never going to be. Fully three dimensional interfaces are, are kind of interesting. I mean, Jim Clark, uh, I mentioned the graphics man. His 3D design system involved moving around a three-dimensional device um, and wearing a head-mounted display and looking at things as stereo. And the, what you learn about this very soon is that it's actually very difficult to do anything very precise with your hand floating in space. And we can do something very precise when you're constrained to work in 2D on a piece of paper. So it depends whether you want freedom or... or, or, or and, the sort of hand you're waving of whether you want to do something very precise. <coughs> but I think the other th point I'd make is that the size of the screens is virtually hasn't changed. I mean, what I want is a desktop which is a screen. You know, I want the whole of my desk to be a screen. Uh, so rather than putting the desktop on the screen, I want to put the screen on the desktop. Um, and we did have one display at Cambridge at one stage which had uh, a screen 100 centimetres by 70 and it had a resolution of 100,000 by 70,000 points. Um, and you could actually go up the, the screen with magnifying glass and see more detail. And that, that was quite an amazing system to work with. But when we, we never really used it as a complete screen. What we did was we do a bit up here and then we do a bit up here and we'd have drawings all over the place, much as you'd have with your desk with bits of paper all over the place. And I think if we can get round to that kind of interface, it might be rather interesting. They've been attempts, but the, there are things which will recognise what's on your desk and say, Digi you put a piece of paper down there and digitise it and, and so on. But, but there's, the actual desk isn't a high resolution display. I think if you could do that, that would be very interesting. Okay, um, I think if, if there are no more questions, uh, then uh, we'll thank you very much for coming and uh, giving us such a precise and personal insight into the history of computing and computer graphics. And um, thank you for your questions and your time, and uh, come back next week. <laughs>